and I am the regional advisor for the East Asia and Pacific region. And I am joined here today by um, uh, my colleagues and also uh, three other Gilman alumni ambassadors. I think currently we only have two Gilman alumni ambassadors, but hopefully the third one will pop in soon. Um, so um, I'll go ahead and pass it on to my colleague, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our re-entry uh, webinar session. Uh, we're excited to provide you guys with some additional information on um, how to make your re-entry experience a little better. Um, and we're happy to have our alumni ambassadors uh, here with us. And I'll pass it on to Isaiah. Isaiah, I don't think we can hear you. I see that your mic is off, but I don't think we can hear you. Oh. Or. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, Um. yeah, just I'm Isaiah. I went to Australia my senior year um, and pretty much, yeah. I went to University of Nebraska Lincoln, um, studying environmental research and science. Awesome, thank you, Isaiah. Um, and next, we'll pass it on to Chris. Hi, my name is Chris, and I graduated from the University of Maryland College Park in 2022, and I completed a bachelor's degree in economics, and I had the opportunity to complete a virtual program in Israel. Thank you so much, Chris. And also, um, I forgot to mention for uh, any questions that you have, please type it in the Q&A um, section. And we will try to get to your questions at the end. Um, like I said before, there's a lot of information. Um, so just feel free to type it in the Q&A. Okay, we'll go ahead to the next slide. So let me see here. Okay, so. Um, welcome to the Gilman alumni community. So you are joining an alumni community of over 41,000, and there are many ways to stay engaged moving forward. Congratulations again on winning the Gilman Scholarship, which, which makes you part of an elite group of undergraduates. We'll be ending this webinar today with a discussion of academic and professional benefits available to Gilman alumni, as well as opportunities for staying involved with Gilman in the future. So um, we're gonna go over, you know, what is re-entry? And re-entry is an emotional and psychological stage of readjustment, mm -hmm. similar to the adjustment period you experienced when you first went abroad. It occurs when you are in the process of returning to the US after time overseas and tra um, traditioning back into your home culture, um, personally, academically, and professionally. Many factors may influence readjustment to your home culture, including the length of time you were away, any previous international experience, your level of contact with friends or family back at home, and whether you enjoyed your time abroad. You have likely changed because of your study or intern abroad experience, although you might have not noticed these changes um, in yourself uh, right away, your friends and family might see an increase in qualities such as confidence, independence, and resourcefulness. And the weeks and months that you uh, follow your return to the US, recognizing and processing these changes can help you maximize the impact that your experience will have on your future. While abroad, you may have viewed the US through rose-colored glasses. It's common to make generalizations like American food is better or the American way of doing this makes more sense to me. When you return home, it can be shocking to find that some things do not match the impression that you had of them abroad. Many students also have an expectation of total familiarity or being able to pick up exactly where they left off. 
things may have changed at home as well. So your friends and family have their own lives and things happened since you've been gone. As such, essentially, students don't expect their home culture, um, something considered known and precious to change without them there. Okay. And so we're gonna go over also reverse culture shock. So most people expect some sort of culture shock at the beginning of their program abroad, but fewer anticipate the reverse culture shock that often happens after returning home. Preparing for reverse culture shock can help limit its effects. Reverse culture shock refers to the discomfort associated with acclimating back to your home culture. After adjusting to life in your host country, you will view the U.S. through different lenses. Upon your return, you may notice things about Americans and American culture that you didn't really notice um, before you left. So this diagram illustrates the stages of adjustment faced by most international travelers. So um, numbers one through five refer to the stages that take place uh, within your host country. So when you were abroad, but for our webinar today, we'll talk about numbers six through nine, the stages that occur after you get home. Just like when you went abroad, you can expect peaks and valleys of your reentry experience. Most people start at a high point um, when they're excited to be home, see friends and family, and just get back to a familiar routine. Then you may start to feel frustrated or lonely because those closest to you just don't understand what you experienced and how you changed. You may be missing the host culture and your friends there and looking for ways to return. Gradually, you'll readjust to life at home things will start to seem routine again. And though you'll be viewing them through a different lens, so it will not exactly be the same. Finally, you'll incorporate what you learned and experience abroad in your new life and career. Um, so now we're gonna go on to the challenges of reverse culture shock. And in this case, um, there's symptoms of reverse culture shock um, that may vary between, you know, person to person, but some common signs are reversed homesickness. So just like you may have missed home when you first went abroad, you may miss your host country now that you're back home. Frustration. It can be difficult to convey what you felt, learned, and experienced abroad, especially to an audience without much international travel experience. If a relative asks you, you know, how was Spain, it's almost impossible to distill your experience down to something bite-sized for them. Some tips for this to encourage your audience to study, intern, or travel abroad to find these experiences for themselves. If you're finding it difficult to convey what you gained from that experience, uh, just take time to write down your thoughts and to, in order to process them better. Connect with others who have studied abroad recently. Share your stories with them and listen actively when they are sharing with you. So boredom is another uh, sign. So while overseas, everything was just new and different since living abroad con um, presents constant challenges and opportunities. After you return home though, settling back into your old routine, while can be comfortable, can also seem pretty boring compared to your life abroad. These feelings are normal and can be countered by getting more involved with your local community and finding ways to stay engaged with the community you lived abroad. Uncertainty. So what are you gonna do with all these new perspectives and passions that you have? Your experience may have altered your future plans, causing you to feel a little anxious. So um, I want to pass it on to our alumni ambassadors and um, wanted to ask if they could share a little bit about their reentry experience and what was challenging or unexpected. Um, so first we'll go with Isaiah. Yeah, um, so I'm not able to show my video right now, but basically my experience was 
pretty unique, I think. Um, so I went to Australia um, in the middle of the winter. It was in January. And so it was in the dead of winter. So when I came back, I was adjusting to, from like hot summers down there because we're in the Southern Hemisphere. Hot summers and hot days to like, um, I don't know, really freezing cold. I'm from Nebraska, so it was really a lot of snow. Um, obviously, Australia has like not that different of a culture as the U.S. So like I didn't have as much of a culture shock, um, but it was definitely still like a shock for me um, coming back with a completely different time zone um, and then completely different seasons. And um, my flight back was 17 hours. So like even just adjusting to that was really difficult. Um, so I'm coming back into like a freezing area that's um, really like, I don't know, my, my sleep schedule is completely flipped. It was definitely an adjustment. And so it was kind of tough to kind of reroute myself back in the US, um, back in Nebraska. Um, and it took me like actually like a week or so to fully feel like I was back on my feet after coming back from Australia. Wow, thank you so much, Isaiah. Yeah, that's a that's a long flight that you had to endure. But yeah, definitely. It was, it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> but um but I'm glad you over um came it and that's true. Yeah, you just gotta give yourself like a little bit of time to kind of just get back into your routine. Um and just, you know, have have patience with it. Um, how about Chris? What about you? Uh, since I completed a virtual program, I did not have any like flight that I had to take or anything. It was more so I had my final assignments for the course and then things kind of wrapped up. But one thing that was really nice is, uh, it, first of all, I took the time to reflect on what I learned and what I plan to do with the knowledge in the future. And then also to get on to like the next step of the follow on service project that we will get to later. <laughs> That's very true. Yes. Thanks, Chris, for sharing that. Um, so next, we're going to go over the overcoming of a reverse culture shock. So here are um, some strategies for dealing with reverse culture shock and also the reentry process. Um, so say goodbye to friends and plan ways to keep in touch, either by maybe scheduling Zoom meetings or FaceTime dates. Um, that This kind of just helps find a routine for you to stay in touch um, in each other's lives, especially since you make kind of like special bonds and connections um, with those that you've studied abroad with and those that you have met abroad as well. Share your experiences with close friends. Um, so anyone who's been abroad, even just for a short period of time, knows how hard it can be to keep quiet about your adventures. But you want to be careful not to sound too pretentious about your stay abroad, preventing that glazed over look um, that comes from knowing when and where your knowledge is wanted. Making comparisons between cultures is natural, especially after living abroad. However, be careful not to seem too critical of home or too lavish in praise about your host country. A balance of good and bad features is probably more accurate, showing an interest in what others have been doing while you have been on your adventures overseas is the surest way to reconnect. A lot of frustration stems from what is perceived as disinterest by others in their experience and a lack of opportunity to tell their stories. Being a good listener as well as a talker is key. Reflect on your time abroad. If you had a journal or blog while abroad, um, keep posting for about a month after your return. This will help you process all that you learned and establish next steps. Prepare a short elevator speech uh, for people who ask about your experience. It can be hard to answer. So how was your trip in a few minutes or seconds that a friend or colleague might offer? It may help to have an elevator speech prepared. Rather than settling with, it was great, try highlighting a few significant moments that stick out in your memory, such as a course you really enjoyed or your favorite aspect of your host culture. This will also help you feel fresh, um, yes, help you feel frustrated that no one wants to listen about your experiences abroad. Try connecting with other returnees to share insights. Some ways to connect are through online networking, your home campus, and alumni groups such as our Gilman alumni. 
reflect on your time abroad. Um, this can be through journals or worksheets, whatever is best for you. Share your story through print or online media where others are eager to learn about your experiences. Examples could include blogs, newsletters, or connecting with your study abroad office to advise future students going to your host country. Share your photos from abroad by emailing them to gilmanphotos at iie.org or connecting with your study abroad office. If you would like to submit photos to Gilman, please read our photo submission guidelines on the Gilman Alumni Follow-on Service Project website for more details. So um, a question for our alumni ambassadors. After returning home, how did you stay engaged with your host community or cope with symptoms of reverse culture shock? And this time I'll start off with Chris. So I would really recommend taking some time to reflect about the experience and everything. And for culture, reverse culture shock, especially just to allow yourself to adjust again, because switching time zones can be overwhelming and even cultures, different food, and just to get back into the daily routine, it often doesn't happen overnight. So to slowly but surely get back into it and not to get disappointed or frustrated, it may take some additional time. And to also, as um, was mentioned, to share your story, to meet up with friends, both new and old friends even, and stay in touch with the community that you were able to form in your host country too, and to reach out to them for support and guidance as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Isaiah, how about yourself? Um, yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, from my experience, um, I definitely had to take some time to fully adjust. I'd say like probably two weeks, I feel like I was back on my feet, um, especially with the time zone difference. Um, one thing that is really real is you guys mentioned sharing photos from abroad. Um, it is hard to explain your experience when um, you come back and a lot of people have questions and you're eager, eager to tell the story, but it is difficult to sum it up. And I'm a big photo guy. I tell a lot of stories through photos um, and I take a lot of photos all the time. So like I found it really easy to um, not just like explain myself with other people by sharing all the photos that I took on my trip and explaining how it went. Um, but also reliving that when I'm going through my photos. And if I'm missing Australia or missing my experience, I myself can just scroll through my photos and like relive that in a way um, to really feel like I'm transitioning back in a healthy way. That's not just, you know, cold turkey. So I definitely recommend photos as a, a way to adjust. That's a great tip. Thank you so much. All right. So next, um, I just want to also kind of plug in uh, any mental health resources as well. So sometimes with reverse culture shock, it can mask other feelings or emotions that you think can be something else. And let's say some time has passed and you have overcome your reverse culture shock stage, but there's something else that's bothering you or making you feel different compared to before. So it is important to acknowledge and take care of your mental health and if you're unsure what to do, here are a few options. So definitely reach out to someone, whether it be your you know, sorority sister or fraternity brother, RA, friend, sibling, et cetera. It is important to express what you are feeling and thinking. They can always lead you to find the resources you need or provide moral support. Most of your home universities will have some sort of counseling services for students. And if you do not know of any, um, speak to your study abroad advisor as that they might be able to direct you. And you can also visit mentalhealthfirstaid.org slash mental health resources for more information regarding mental health resources in your area that could be low cost or free. And now I will pass it on to my colleague, Stephanie, um, and she will go over follow on service project and re-entry motions. Yeah. Hey, all. Um, yeah. So um, part of your uh, follow on service project is really a great way for you guys to resettle back into your campus or community. And you can really use your follow on project to help deal with those challenges of reentry that you may experience. Um, definitely use your follow on service project as a vehicle to tell your story. You this is the opportunity for you to recount what was important to you personally, professionally, um, and um, academically and, and how you grew. Who were some of the influencers during your time abroad? What big events 
happened that really shaped the trajectory for, again, your personal, professional, or academic paths. You also want to try to integrate your specific experiences abroad to make it relevant to the target audience that you're going to be speaking to. Be sure to give some background information about yourself and speak to your audience as though they're stepping into your shoes. If your target audience, for example, is the LGBT, uh, LGBTQ community on your campus, really highlight your experiences where you actually interacted with others in that community abroad or relevant experiences for you as a member of that community while you're overseas. You also really wanna to try to incorporate others as you share your experience. You want to engage your audience by asking questions that show how they can also go abroad. We know that it's never too late or too early for your audience to start thinking about study abroad. Um, also, we recommend you guys don't wait to complete your follow-on service project. We know life happens, different circumstances change, but six months can go by really quickly. So it's really important to get started. And obviously a lot of you may start that while you're abroad. Um, and this um, getting started on your follow-on service project uh, is also key in helping with your re-entry. Um, and so for our alumni ambassadors, what was your follow-on service project and how did it help um, with your re-entry? Did you make any adjustments to your project after returning from abroad? And let's start with um, Isaiah. Um, yeah, so for my follow-on service project, um, I reached out to a community that I'm already part of at home. Um, it's the Buffett Foundation and they were pivotal in me deciding that I wanted to study abroad and they have great resources. Um, and so I, I chose to go that route. Um, because they have a good way to reach out to students. Um, and I definitely kind of took my time with my follow and service project. I, not that I was um, putting it off to the side, but I wanted to really gather myself and gather my resources and decide how I wanted to tell my story. Um, because I, I really felt like it, studying abroad was really important for me and I wanted to make sure I had a really um, composed version of like my experience. And then I felt like I definitely made it something enjoyable too, because when I did my follow on service project, um, I looked at it less of like a homework assignment, but more of like a really authentic expression of my experience. And so doing that, I found, I really enjoyed doing my project and it actually helped me decide that I wanted to become an ambassador as well. Um, so it, it was just really relieving to be able to tell my story um, through my community um, with Buffett and with Gilman, so. Great, thanks so much. And yeah, that, that's always an important part is putting your authentic self into your follow-on service project instead of thinking it as some homework assignment that you really need to do and, and telling your story about what you experienced abroad. Um, and Chris. Yeah, so I, since I originally was supposed to um, go or complete a program in New Zealand, I did have to change my follow-on service project because that course didn't take place then. Then I found another course that was focusing on Israel and migration. So that was also a good opportunity then to adjust the service project, to see what needs to be changed. But I also did take my time with a follow-on service project. And I also took the time to put the project together in the sense that I tried to make a personal connection to it as well, which I thought was really nice to be able to make. And yeah, I would just recommend completing it um within the dead or within the time frame if you need an extension to reach out if you need to make any changes to reach out especially if there was something during your Gilman that just really stood out to you and you didn't include your follow on service project before and you want to change it to just see if it's possible to make that adjustment and then to focus on that Great. And that's actually a great plug for, um, we do, as Chris um, stated, we do allow you guys to extend your follow on service project deadline um, for up to another six months. So usually within a year, unless there's some other special circumstances, then you can uh, request that extension through your Gilman online portal, um, through the alumni section of your Gilman portal. Um, as well as if, again, if anything needed to have changed since obviously you wrote your original follow-on service project when you were applying, if something had changed, we do allow revisions and you can find more information about what we're looking for in that uh, revis revision request on the Gilman website. 
um, under the alumni section, and it's literally a little um, accordion area uh, labeled follow on service project revisions. Um, so feel free to contact also your Gilman regional advisor um, for any questions you have on that. All right. So um, some reflection activities for those of you who are returning from abroad. If um, again, we uh, are providing our um, re-entry um, tool uh, kit. Um, if you guys find that you have been having a difficult time readjusting to life back in the United States, we encourage you to take advantage of some of the reflection activities um, that we've provided um, in the alumni section of our website. This particular re-entry toolkit um, includes exercises um, of, again, reflection activities, journal prompts. We've compiled a list of other resources for overcoming reverse culture shock, um, effectively articulating your experience, and integrating your experience into your career search with um, other resources like a sample resume points, interview questions, and cover letter text. So you guys can find these things at the gilmanscholarship.org forward slash alumni. And then you just go into the re-entry section. But there is this little toolkit guide um, that we highly recommend that you guys check out again on the alumni section of the Gilman website. And then, so up next, we just wanted to talk about some ways that you can use your Gilman experience in your future endeavors. Um, we'll talk about some of these more in depth, but some of the um, examples include adding your overseas experience and your status as a Gilman scholar to your resume, because we are a highly competitive um, State Department uh, scholarship. Um, you also want to, um, you know, if you're seeking an internship and how to connect that to your major and experience abroad, how to continue staying connected with Gilman through online networking, becoming a Gilman alumni ambassador, just like Chris and Isaiah are, um, expanding again on your follow on service projects, applying for other international institutions, um, other international opportunities such as Boren or, or Fulbright. We have lots of Gilmans that go on to do other scholarship and other international programs. Um, and also attending an in-person career development workshop for uh, Gilman alumni. Um, so these are some development workshops that Gilman um, runs. And so these workshops do take place all over the United States. Travel stipends are offered to you guys. And we announce those every year in our alumni newsletter. So these are some other opportunities that you guys get as Gilman alum um, to also use and um, uh, to use your Gilman experience in other endeavors as you continue on in your academic and professional careers. Okay, so um, we wanted to take some time to get you guys to think about uh, skills you gained while abroad. And these are skills that you can def definitely incorporate into your resume, your cover letter, and your elevator speech about your experiences abroad. We've listed some of the examples here, such as um, a new skill you would have learned while studying abroad is adapting to new environments. A lot of students have never been outside the United States, and you've learned to adapt to an entirely new culture, a way of life, a whole other region of the world. Um, you know, having an approach to complex issues with an open mind, trying to even communicate uh, despite difficult language barriers. If you didn't go and study the local language before you went abroad, you still were communicating well overseas. Um, managing some crises. Some of you may have lost a passport. Some of you may have lost your wallet while overseas. A computer stopped working in a foreign country and you know you had learned to address that. Um, but asking our alumni ambassadors for some of their examples, what was the most important skill that you guys felt you learned or developed while abroad? And I'll start with Chris. So I would say two of the skills were to be resourceful and to also be open-minded. 
And I've previously been abroad. In those cases, I would say when there are communication barriers, you often find other ways to communicate. If it's by trying to speak the local language a few words and then realizing, okay, maybe English is a better language to speak or just to try to communicate in any way possible, even through translating apps and things like that. So there are a lot of different resources, becoming aware of what is out there and what is the best to use in which circumstance as well, even with regards to like, navigating public transport how do you navigate public transport in a foreign country and purchasing a train ticket and things like that or even setting up a phone and a sim card so overcoming those challenges i feel like it can be worth a lot <laughs> because those are the things that will enable the experience to continue to to continue to learn as well while you're abroad once you're, you have communication set up then you can maybe meet up with other people from your program or locally or local friends even. So just the small, being aware of that small step or that it's a process and every small step can have a big impact later on to help. So just being aware of the whole experience and their ups and their downs and just reflecting on it and seeing what you learn from the program as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, for definitely for me, um, it was communication as well. Um, for most of you guys and myself included, your program probably has something to do with your professional field. Um, so you'll get the experience to communicate with like professional people that you're experiencing while you're abroad. Um, for me, I'm in a science field and I got the chance to communicate with scientists about like some of the environmental issues in Australia. Um, and that was super valuable for me because it's something that I, I mean, I, I came back and I graduated and now I work where I also do the same thing. And so that was great practice for me before I entered my field when I graduated. Great, yeah. And as we um, noted in the slide, yeah, you guys are trying to understand these nonverbal cues to try to communicate with others. And for those of you who are doing um, international internships, you're also gonna be working as or, or have finished working in international scholarship. Sorry, we've been doing some pre-departure stuff as well. Um, but you're also uh, learned in how to work as part of a diverse team. And a lot of companies and a lot of organizations love when uh, students and graduates um, have experience as working as part of an internationalized and diverse team. So those are just some of the skills that you guys should think about um, as you're um, reacclimating being back into the US and moving forward in your academic and professional careers. Uh, so next. Um, yeah, so highlighting those new skills in a resume. We definitely recommend that you add your transferable skills from studying or interning abroad to your resume to show why you would be a valuable employee. Um, again, if your program was primarily academic, you definitely want to list the program details under the education section of your resume. If your program included an experiential learning component, such as an internship, work experience, or a volunteer opportunity, include it in your, in, uh, your experience section of your resume. You can also list leadership achievements, honors, and skills that you developed abroad under the appropriate headings. Also, you can add any foreign language acquisition and level, as well as any other skills that you've learned abroad abroad to the skills section of your resume. You definitely want to remember to include your status as a Gilman Scholar and that you guys are eligible or have a non-competitive eligibility status or an NCE status. As you're working on your resume, again, list your skills and experiences in a way that demonstrate how you met the qualifications for the position. Whenever possible, you want to use exact language from the position description in your resume rather than rephrasing in your own words. For many jobs, the first review of applicants is on a digital resume scan. So if your resume doesn't include certain keywords from the position description, your application won't be reviewed. So definitely, um, take time to list out those skills that we kind of went over in the previous slide and, and how you can add that best into your resume. Um, and again, we have more information in that toolkit on working um, your 
domain uh, and experiences abroad or internships abroad into your resume. So you should be able to find more information on our website on that. Um, so yeah. And I'm just trying to go through so that we have some time at the end to answer all your guys' questions. Um, and we have so much information to give you guys um, in this reentry webinar. Um, so again, continuing on with these transferable skills and in interviews, we often advise attorneys to practice answering interview questions with specific examples to show how your skills and experiences will translate into the professional world. We encourage you guys to use STAR uh, method or situation, task, action, results um, and a, as an approach when answering interview questions. So you're going to go and look at a job description and find three to four key skills or traits for the position. Then you'll find examples from your recent past, including, again, your education abroad or internship abroad experiences to answer behavioral questions that show that you have the skills that they're actually looking for. For example, if you're asked about a time that you worked with somebody who did not share your communication style and how you handled the situation, you could talk about your study abroad program in Chile and how you learned how to successfully communicate and complete a group project with Spanish speakers, despite the language barriers you may have encountered and as somebody who is not native to that language. So again, um, you're looking at situation, which is describe the context of the challenge you have overcome, task, what was your exact role or responsibility in the situation, and what was your end goal? Next, um, action. Explain the sequence of it, uh, actions and your thought process for dealing with this challenge. Why did you choose the method that you did? And finally, you want to talk about results. So you want to summarize the tangible results and impact of your work and decisions. How are things better off because of your input? You want to use a high level of detail here and some concrete evidence to show the full impact of your initiatives. So again, listing these transferable skills in your interviews and especially um, using the STAR method to really um, enhance um, that, those interview skills and uh, you as a candidate for that position. So going to our alumni ambassadors, how did you or how do you guys plan to highlight what you learned in your overseas experience? What um, impact did you guys experience? Um, did your experience have on your academic or your career trajectory? Um, Isaiah? Um, yeah, so as soon as I got back into the US, um, I was very quick to put everything I learned on my resume and my cover letters um, and get it ready for um, applying for jobs because I was a senior and I was getting ready to get out in the professional field. And so I was gathering all my resources and I was ready. Um, and as soon as I found out what NC NCE was, I was ready to put it to use. Um, and so since I had that immediately after graduation, I remember um, reaching out to all the federal positions near me and I just threw in my application and started speaking to other employers near me. And I really wanted to um, become employed in the federal scope. And with my status, um, I interviewed and got a position with the Corps of Engineers where I now work full time. And so I think that with the Gilman experience and highlighting all of the like skills that I learned on my trip um, and just being a uh, Gilman alumni, it helped me so much in getting my job um, immediately after graduation. Like a lot of people sometimes have trouble getting positions immediately after college. Um, and NCE was a huge boost for me. And I don't think I would have gotten here without it. Without it. So it's super helpful and it's super important to utilize um, everything that Gilman offers once you graduate and finish your program. And I'm pretty sure you can also defer um, your NCE status for after you graduate, am I correct? There's a deferment option if you're um, still attending the university. Yeah, so if yeah. you guys have not graduated um, or continue on to a graduate program, or we have some scholars that actually have to complete military service, there are special situations and circumstances where we can extend uh, that NCE. 
status. And you guys can find that in our, and thank you for bringing it up. Uh, we do have a non-competitive non -competitive eligibility or NCE guide, again, on the alumni section of the Gilman website. And that lists out um, all sorts of tips and facts about your NCE and how to use it um, on our website. So definitely check it out if you have more specific questions on what the NCE status is how to use it and uh, what's eligible to use it on, including um, requesting potential extensions for that. And Chris? Awesome, yeah. So I also put a lot of the resources from Gilman to use. And another great thing is once you complete the follow-on service project and all the requirements, you also get access to like a LinkedIn badge that you can add to your LinkedIn profile so everyone's aware that you are a Gilman. Scholar, which is also great because it can make it easier if someone's looking for Gilman scholars in particular, or if even a Gilman scholar is looking for another Gilman scholar to ask questions about a certain country or area where the application process is really helpful. And then after completing my course, focusing on migration, I actually was inspired to take another course at my university, which was a film course focusing on migration. And during the same semester, I took another course film course focusing on liberation, and then another one focusing on jazz. And they were really interesting classes. So I definitely recommend learning more even about the field where you complete your coursework in, or even if you do an internship to also learn more about that field later on, because it, can, it can't hurt to learn more, to put the knowledge to use, and to also share it with other people. Great, thanks. You, you both should just run this uh, webinar because you guys are the best bridges for the next <laughs> pieces of information. Um, but also, yeah, um, and we also, I'll be talking a little about that. We also run different workshops and programs um, where there's additional opportunities for alumni to travel again overseas for different webinars and overseas seminars. Um, so those are additional opportunities to gain new skills and new experience based on um, a particular uh, thematic topic, such as we just recently completed our immigration and foreign policy uh, virtual overseas uh, seminars. So always more opportunities. Um, so again, as Chris and Isaiah have stated perfectly, there are lots of benefits and resources available to Gilman alumni to stay up to, uh, updated on just different opportunities and new opportunities as Gilman alum. Um, so you guys definitely want to be sure to subscribe to our alumni newsletter and to su subscribe to that newsletter and learn more about these opportunities, visit the alumni section of the website where you can register for that because we often advertise um, new opportunities and networking opportunities, both in the newsletter, also on our social media platforms and then LinkedIn. Um, again, going over some of the other community uh, networking opportunities you guys have, again, um, and development opportunities you guys have is, again, you have the non-competitive eligibility hiring status for federal jobs, meaning you can be hired outside of the normal competitive process. So you're kind of outside the general pool of applicants, which as Isaiah gave a perfect example of, um, really is very helpful in uh, work starting a career in um, the federal government with federal jobs. Um, you can also network online with other Gilman alumni in our closed Facebook group and LinkedIn groups, as well as the Gilman Scholar Network, which has a great directory and a mentor program as well. Um, these can be a great resource for you guys to stay connected. You can help mentor new Gilman scholars, um, as well as use uh, the Gilman Scholar Network to le uh, le leverage the Gilman Alumni Network for other professional developments. Um, often alumni or Gilman staff members will post relevant jobs to these groups as well. And you guys can also add your own. Um, so hopefully Isaiah has new postings that he could add into our Gilman Scholar Network for fe fellow scholars and alum. Um, we also have an archive of webinars on the website on topics like opportunities to go abroad again, using your non-competitive eligibility status and leveraging LinkedIn in your career search. 
And finally, uh, the Gilman program partners with higher education institutions across the country every year to offer in-person professional development seminars for Gilman alumni. And again, we announce all of these opportunities on our website, social media, and the alumni newsletter. Um, and again, um, this can be through our US Future Leaders Seminar Series, our, overseas, our virtual and overseas seminar series, and just a lot of other networking and professional development workshops that we offer across the country throughout the year. And yeah, so before we wrap up, I'll have Sam uh, close us out, but we hope that uh, a lot of these tips were useful for you guys and to definitely, as we said, check out the alumni newsletter as well as the alumni section of the Gilman website for lots of great opportunities for you guys to help resettle back into the US and really process all of your study abroad or intern um, experiences abroad. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so you can also feel free to contact us. Um, we do have a phone number, um, which is listed there uh, on the slide. And then we also have all of the regional email offices, um, I'm sorry, email, email addresses. Um, and so you can reach out to your um, regional advisor there for more specific information on anything that we talked about today. Um, we are always happy to help, um, especially navigating this, you know, reverse culture shock and reentry section of your lives. Um, and so we've kind of wrapped up at least the content portion. Um, so if there's any questions that you guys have now, we will definitely take it because um, now we still have about like a maybe like 13 minutes left. Um, so please feel free to write it in the Q&A or the chat, whichever you prefer. Um, and you can, it can be anything about the reentry process. Um, so don't be shy. And feel free to ask any questions of Chris or Isaiah about their own uh, reentry experiences, um, even about any other professional development opportunities they've taken or used while um, being alumni of the Gilman program. So otherwise we'll wait a few minutes, but if we don't get too many questions, just my opportunity to say thank you, Chris and Isaiah for great um, experiences that you've shared with our Gilman scholars and upcoming Gilman alumni. I think we have one question. Um, so someone asked, how do we go about getting the LinkedIn badges and social media groups? Um, so it, the best way would be to go onto the Gilman Scholar Network. Um, actually, I'll refer to Chris. Um, Chris, how did you get your LinkedIn badge? I believe after completing all the requirements, I received a notification. It was like an email eventually. That I can add it. I think it's, it's like a platform. Is it Credibly or Badgely or something along those lines? And then you go on there and log in and it will let you add it. So I think it's it was more of an automated process, I believe. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Yes. So definitely log in and make sure you complete all your requirements. One of those requirements also is the follow on service project and anything that you need to complete in the alumni tab of your Gilman portal. So that's the one that you use, you know, for document collection when you were abroad, all that stuff. Definitely make sure to complete all those modules um, because that also will give you the badge status as well and allow you to apply for other Gilman alumni opportunities. Any other questions also can be specifically to Chris or Isaiah. Okay, well, I think, uh, yeah, no other questions, but if there are any other questions that you do uh, come up with later, again, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and also, oh wait, uh, we have something. And yes, and feel free to reach out to Chris. Um, and also Isaiah through the Gilman Scholar Network or through LinkedIn um, or any of those platforms. Um, 
But again, we appreciate you for taking the time to come and to listen to our webinar. Again, a huge uh, thank you to Chris and Isaiah for volunteering their time uh, to speak about this subject, because um, it's really nice to get the perspective, especially of a Gilman who went on a study abroad program um, that um, is in the same shoes as the people that are coming back from that experience. So thank you again. But all right, um, thank you so much for joining and I hope you have a good rest of your day and also rest of your week. Take care now, bye-bye.